your version has the sizzle, your version has it all. Mine is just, you know, some guy meeting a girl in a restaurant. That's a, that's, a, that's a great question and a controversial one because there are all sorts of people who, who, uh, who approach it through a very, um, through, through a long period of preparation. And a, lot of, and, and a lot of people do very well that way. They jot down thoughts, then they uh, begin to organize them, then they outline, then they uh, outline again, outline again, outline again, and only then do they begin to write. And that is a great way to do it if that's you. You know, but it depends on whether that's you. That's not me. That is, however, the industry I'm in, especially now. You have to uh, outline, you have to do treatments, you have to pitch the story, you have to write the story before you're hired to write the story. So we all have to learn if we want to be pros. We all now in this day and age have to learn that skill. Even I dare say um, uh, novelists have to, unless they really have a work that they can present to a publisher and is, is ready ready enough for the publisher to spark to it. Um, but here's the, the, the thing that, that I have trouble with, uh, with that. And there are exceptions. Um, I was friendly with uh, E.L. Doctorow before he died, um, Edgar Doctorow. And he uh, always amazed me because his books were so beautiful and so beautifully constructed. And he would say, I never know where I'm going. I just start with a sentence and I don't know, I don't know where it's going after that. And he would say, it's like driving in fog. You can't see more than a couple feet ahead of you, but you can go the whole way like that. That's a, a great question. It's one of the questions that always uh, gets asked in any sort of writing seminar or whatever, because um, you know we're we're all we're all if we're if we're storytelling, we're all trying to figure out how to approach that. And um, my you know as I was as I was. Uh, speaking before about what my tendency is and and the the Dr. O style um, of just starting and then you just go. Uh, uh, so that's 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 a version of um, start from the beginning and go to the end. But you know, um, even in that version, somewhere along the way, somewhere well before the end, the end should be in sight. You should you should be. Let's say let's say you are if you're outlining. You, in a way, don't have this problem. You know, you know you're going to outline and you're going to you're going to figure things out. You're going to know what the ending is. Um, if you're doing the um, the driving in fog version, which, by the way, the Cohen brothers also do, um, but very very few people in, in the movie and TV business do it. You're you're going to you're going to be um, heading down a dark road, but uh, somewhere along the way, you're going to get a glimmer of the end, and you have to you have to be alert for it. You have to sort of attune yourself. You know, it's as though um, you're, you, it's as though you're just aware of trouble ahead and the end is the trouble that's ahead. You're going to have to get there and it's going to have to be fantastic. And you can do a beautiful, beautiful job up until the end. And if you blow the ending, you don't stick the landing. It's, you know, it's all for naught. That's what, that's what your reader, that's what your viewer will leave with. So you have to, you know, you have to be sort of watching for it. That doesn't mean that when you see it, you're right because, um, the greatest thing is to surprise yourself at the same time. So you're, you're, you know, you might have a provisional ending and you might be working towards that ending and you might be saying, okay, I know where this has to go. I feel good about that. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm preparing the way I'm making the ride as fun as a, a ride as it can be. Uh, but uh, we know where, where it has to end. And then if some, if, if along the way, um, you get to know your story well enough, you may have the freedom to completely change the end and have it be even more satisfying. So you have to leave room for that. But um, you, the, the, the thing you probably can't do is leave the question of what the end is until the end, because then you're in a corner and you have, you know, you've run out of options and you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to rip up some of the road that you've built in order to get to someplace satisfying. Uh, okay. If you're pitching to producers, uh, you, you want to keep it uh, to 15 or 20 minutes, however many pages that, that is. Uh, less okay. is better, more usually isn't. Um, and you want to give them a sense of what they're going to see if they watch this show, 
You want to give them a sense of what the pilot is. You want to give them a sense of who your characters are, and you want to talk. You want to describe in some depth, um, you know, four or five of them, not more. Uh, and you want uh, this is strangely important. You want to tell them why you, why this is important for you, why you are the person to write this show. Uh, the rewrite. <laughs> I've known people for whom the rewrites never stop. I don't know if you ever knew a, a writer named uh, or know of a writer named Jerzy Kozinski, but he and I were friends, and uh, uh, he, he's he's uh, uh, been dead for a couple of decades now. Uh, um, although there's a new movie of his uh, uh, first novel, The Painted Bird, just out last year. Um, he uh, uh, was would keep rewriting even after publication so that the uh, paperback version was very different from the hardcover version, which all of his publishers just hated him for. But we all, we all I mean, some of us hate rewriting. I, I think the people who hate rewriting don't really uh, quite know what writing is yet, because rewriting is rewriting, as, as some, someone great said. And uh, those of us who, who love it too much uh, need to get it under control simply the same way a painter needs to know when to stop painting. You know, there's a brush stroke that's going to be too much, you know, so what is it? I find that when I'm rewriting, there's a point at which um, I am changing something and then I go back and sort of uh, read it the way I had it before. And really, if I'm very, very honest with myself, there's no qualitative difference. They're both the same. They're both just as good. In that case, I've gone too far and I, I should, I should stop rewriting at least that sentence or that section. Um, you know, uh, I, I recommend that you read everything that you write out loud at some point, not every day, not while you're um, writing in, in, in early phases, not your uh, so-called vomit draft, if you, if you do vomit drafts, which I don't, and I wish I could do a vomit draft, but I'm too, I'm too, I'm too much of a rewriter, too much of a perfectionist, and I always, I can't, I can't move on until something is in pretty good shape. Um, Part of rewriting is is actually a psychological trick because you are putting yourself in the headspace of what you've written. You go, you know, you you. Uh, there's the famous thing that Hemingway said of quitting on a day before you're done, so that when you get there the next morning, you have a place to start. You don't have to sort of rev up from nothing. So the thing is, you, you when you're doing that, you are rewriting. You're you're starting from where you were, where you left off and you are rewriting that and polishing it and making it better. And while you're doing that, you're doing something very important psychologically. You're sinking into the thing. You're going from wherever you were, you know, uh, uh, out in the yard planting your flowers or doing your dishes or getting your kids off to school, not anymore, but <laughs> getting your kids off to homeschool, whatever it was. You're going from that into the deep, 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 deep headspace of what you're writing, which is not, which is way below the earth which is way, you know, it's where you've dug and you have to climb down into it. You can't, you can't, you know, just sort of look down and say, oh, I know it's down there. You don't know what's down there. You have to climb down into it. And rewriting is a, is a great way to do that. Well, you, you, uh, you always have to start, I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but you always, you kind of have to start from outside no matter what. You're not, you're not inside until you get inside. You're not you. You're not in the mine until you've dug through the earth, right? To to belabor horribly the the um, um, metaphor that I was using before. You have to, you really have to get down into it, and so you do have to get inside. And you you kind of know you're inside when um, you're inhabiting your characters, or when you are, or if you're writing an essay, if you're writing something that isn't about characters, where when you are the character and you're seeing where your feelings go and where your thoughts go and you're following them and you're, you know, then you're, then you're inside and you're in the zone and you're not thinking about, hmm, I wonder what I should do here. Hmm, I wonder what I should say about this. All that's outside. You got to get beyond that. How do you get beyond that? You just have to start. Um, uh, I, I wrote down something because I thought people might be asking. A lot of people might not really be writers or might sort of think they have a writer in them and, um, and not know where to begin because you know, you can spend a lot of time not writing and a lot of time thinking about when I write, I, I'll, I'll do this or I'll do that or I'll start here, or I'll start there. Um, and uh, uh, 
then a lot of people sit down and maybe they start to write with a lot of throat clearing, you know. Learn to recognize, if you can, that you're just clearing your throat, that you're saying, okay, uh, I don't know what to write here, so here I'm going to write this. I, I've read so many beginning writers' um, documents that begin with, you know, something like, something along the lines of basically, hello, huh, what do I mean by that? You know, I mean, that, that's, that's, all, that's all well and good, but you're still outside, outside, outside. So I would say begin in the middle. Begin with what interests you the most. That's the key. Begin with the thing that you're most interested in. Don't think about what anyone else would be interested in. Don't pave the way to it. Don't go back and do, you know, you can always go back and do everything else later, but begin with a thing that is bothering you, the thing that is haunting you, the thing that you're afraid of, the thing that you are, you, the thing that keeps you up at night. Begin with that. And then you can feel, you can, you can, you can pave the, the, the reader's path to that later. Uh, maybe it won't need paving, or maybe it won't need paving in the way that you think it will. But begin with that, and then you'll have started. And once you've started, you are inside. And that's great. That's where you want to be. And then you can just keep rolling and rolling and rolling the snowball down the hill, and it'll grow. But you need the snow, and you need to make a, a little ball to begin with. There are times when um, I, I've written something I just am so sure could only be said one way, and then a fantastic actor comes along and says it in a completely different way, and I go, wow, I sure didn't hear it that way. And, you know, does it work? Yeah, maybe it works. Maybe it was better than what I had. Or maybe I need to change what I did. Um, actors, however, will often say, you know, he wouldn't do that. And you have to take an actor seriously. An actor is, is approaching the... Um, character you've written uh, from a, from a very different place and 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 with a very different perspective and that perspective is one that um, is 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 like gold it's like deeply deeply valuable but that may it may not be right however you know uh, and sometimes when they're saying my character would never do that what they're really saying is I don't see how my character would do that um, and therefore I can't perform it. I can't act it. I can't, I can't get it there the way, the way I want it to be. And then, then you have to come up with the reason or with the, with, you have to, you have to understand your own text well enough to be able to justify it and argue with them. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, you hope it doesn't come down to a power play uh, where, where you're, you're on set and you're going, well, <laughs> I want it the way I want it. Um, and then, you know, a good actor, a reasonable actor, you'll give them one and you'll, t and you'll ask for, for uh, them to give you one, which is the usual way it's, it's, it's done. And then you see in the editing room what, what, what works best. But actor knowledge is very, very important knowledge. But it's not always right. You know, you can't, you also don't want to back down if, if, if you really have a strong feeling. But often an actor will catch us out, you know, where we've written something in a somewhat lazy way or we, where we've, we've heard it in a limit, limited way. And to me, that's incredibly valuable. You know, a good actor will make everything better. The short answer is you're one person, your life is under one umbrella, and there is always the lead pony in your life. There's always the goal that leads the others. And so even that is about description. It's about making all your I am statements and seeing what they have in common and then making one I am statement or one I want statement or one I will create statement. Um, because it, one of the, I think one of the difficulties often in a story, and this you can address, uh, please address the other also. But one of the difficulties in a story is of course, uh, whose point of view? What are you describing? Where are you? What are you feeling? Which thing are you feeling? And although people feel with great complexity in, in a story or in a goal, you have to simplify it. So how do we, how do we simplify it without disemboweling it? Mm, yeah, and, I mean, I think uh, it sounds like in terms of writing, that question is a little bit along the lines of where do I begin? I've got so much whirling around my head. How do I begin? And, and, the, and 
this may uh, this may not be true of um, um, intuition, but it, it, in writing, I think it's true. You just pick one arbitrarily, do it. But you you must you must move from um, that um, sort of that malaise of dithering and wondering and bouncing and and searching for clarity to the clarity that can only come by choosing one arbitrarily. It might be wrong. You might have to redo it. You might have to revise it. You might have to throw it out. You might have to go down a different road entirely and going into it, just going into it, seeing what's there. Is there, is there something there for me? Is there something there that bears fruit? Is there something there that seems to bear fruit? And then I hit a wall. If I do, I, I, I throw it out. I, I, I go in a different direction. Um, you know, some people can find that better through the outlining process because they eliminate in advance all the places that they're going to go that, where they're going to hit a wall. I'm, I'm not uh, one of those people. I have to go and find it and see whether, see whether there's, there's truth there in it. But there's always something as I open myself up, you know, as, I, as, as I'm letting the flower blossom, there's always a little surprise inside. But I'm not, if I, if I, don't, if I don't, you know, pick one, um, then, then I'll never get there. If I, can, if I spend so much time wondering about which one to pick, then what I'm really doing, um, though I may not call it that, is procrastinating. And by the way, he just demonstrated the exact point, which is he took all of these ideas of, well, it's that and it's this and it's that. And, okay, what you're really saying is this. And that is what I think you're, you're a master of. You know, you, you've probably heard writers say, oh, the characters take over and they tell me what um, it should be. And I've always sort of thought, yeah, really? I, that, doesn't, that doesn't really exactly happen with me. I'm waiting for them to do that. That would make my life a lot easier. Uh, at the same time, um, there is something that about a character that is, that is uh, sort of well-formed that will resist certain directions. And it's a little like when we were talking about um, the actor's version of the character versus the writer's version of the character before. There's, there's wiggle room there. There's not, it's not one thing or the other. But after a while, as you get to know a character, there are things he or she wouldn't do. And there are things that, that you, you think they will do. And they are, there are things that are going to surprise you. It's funny when you're, when you're forming characters, um, you, if, you, if you make them completely consistent, they wind up being boring. Uh, if you make them you know, sort of just completely contradictory, they wind up being unbelievable. There is a middle ground that, that you can find, you know, um, almost everyone we know, including ourselves, will do things we didn't expect them to do. We'll do things that seem, quote, out of character, you know, and that makes for interesting, real people. Because we all do that, because we all see that, um, the, uh, because e even when uh, we think a person is predictable, they very often are it. When you create a character like that, then you are creating someone that that probably feels more real than not. Um, so you know, I don't know. A tough guy isn't always going to be tough, and a, a vulnerable, frightened person isn't always going to be vulnerable and frightened. And um, finding a way in which you can make that feel organic and true uh, is. Uh, is part of the challenge, but it's not that distant because we really are that way. We really are so many more things than we give ourselves credit for being. Uh, a lot of people use the tool of um, creating a character sort of uh, uh, off screen in a way of, of saying about any character, um, okay, what was their childhood like? What was their, what were their parents like? What did they, what do they like? You know, actors often do this too. What, what's their, what, how do they like to dress? What's their favorite fruit? Anything like that. All that is interesting and helpful. But when, I've, when I'm doing exercises like that, I also feel um, very arbitrary. And I don't like that feeling that a character is arrived at uh, through a sort of a, a process of just you know, being arbitrary. But there is a point at which I'm getting to know my character and I suddenly begin to, to not to abuse the word, intuit the answers to those questions. I begin to think, you know what? This person would like this and not, and not that, would say this and not that. That's when the character is beginning to come alive. I wouldn't say the character is, you know, taking over, but I'm getting to know the character. The character is beginning to have life, and the character and I are are getting it to be on very very good terms.
dialogue is is uh, is partly a matter of ear, and I I feel that so much of writing is a matter of ear, uh, and uh, an ear, you know, is is a uh, having an ear is a talent, and it is also something you can develop. Um, Certainly, once you start writing dialogue, and once you once you start thinking in terms of writing dialogue, then um, the world becomes a place where people are not just saying what they're saying; they're saying it in dialogue, and you start hearing how people speak. And you know, you, uh, you might take notes on it, and you might, or you might just sort of mutter it to yourself later. You might, um, when the world opens up again, sit in a bar and listen to all the different ways people speak. Uh, again. Uh, a lot of people can write dialogue on the page and as they're reading it back to themselves, it sounds great. And then you can read out loud the same page, same person reading out loud the same page and you'll see, you'll see what's wrong with it. Always read your dialogue out loud. Um, you don't have to do it as you go along. Um, you, can, you can do a whole pass when you're reading the dialogue out loud, but be very alert to how um, uh, dialogue spoken is very, very different from dialogue written. Um, at the same time, dialogue spoken does a lot of things that are very hard to convey on the page and that are sometimes boring and, and don't have uh, electricity and don't have energy. Um, make sure that all your dialogue um, has, 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 has energy. Sometimes a conversation where you're, you are portraying in dialogue a bunch of information, um, exposition, is just going to be dead on the page and you need to find a way to, to, to um, make it go back and forth between between the characters or make it or make it contradictory or make it elliptical or make it you know uh make it uh um, um strangely said in order to bring life to it uh and um you know uh, make sure uh that you are not having your characters speak entirely in shall we say text as opposed to subtext um if uh the, you know, if, if someone is saying, um, um, what do you think of my dress? Uh, and someone else says, oh, I really, really like your dress. That's not interesting. Um, if you say, uh, what do you think of my dress? And the other person says, well, uh, nice buttons. Then you've, then you've, then, then you've got characters talking to each other because you see you know, the, the subtext is the guy doesn't really like the dress. He's saying, you know, he's creating a relationship between them. He's doing something other than, you know, sort of speaking in the in the way that we when we're disparaging dialogue like this, call two on the nose. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot. I, I could I could do three hours about the ins and outs of dialogue, but um, really reading it out loud, making sure it's really how people talk. It's never going to be exactly how people talk. It's always going to be um, stylized in some way, and and part of stylizing it makes it better, makes it more energetic, makes it less real and more real at the same time. It's, you know, it's a magical art uh, and you, you just have to learn it and you have to keep going over it. Read, read people who write good dialogue. In other words, people whose dialogue is, is great on the page. Elmore Leonard's novels are famously wonderful dialogue. David Mamet, you know, you read David Mamet dialogue and it's just, what, what is this? What, you know, and yet then, then you read it aloud and you say, oh yeah, how people talk in a way and in a way that it's completely stylized. But see how people do it. See what the tricks of the trade are and try to incorporate them. Um, it can take a long time to learn how to do it well, but it's, it's essential for, at least for script writing and for novels too, I think.